This odd-looking creature is an African butterfly fish, and it's definitely one of the more unusual fish species in the aquarium hobby. So let's take a closer look. In the wild, they have a diet that consists primarily of insects and insect larvae, as well as small fish, amphibians, worms, and spiders. In captivity, they can also be convinced to eat prepared floating foods such as flakes and pellets, as well as freeze-dried foods. Nonetheless, feeding is probably one of the most difficult aspects of keeping these fish because some individuals refuse to eat prepared foods and insist on only eating live food. Luckily, when you find them in stores, most butterfly fish have already been conditioned to eat these prepared foods, but a long-term diet should also include the occasional live insects such as crickets and mealworms. Furthermore, unless they're frightened, butterfly fish don't usually move very far from the top of the tank, and they won't eat any food that's not floating right at the surface of the water. So you'll need to feed foods that float, and it can also be very helpful to have a few tank mates to clean up any leftover bits of food that sink to the bottom. Avoid keeping butterfly fish with any small fish that likes to swim near the top of the tank because little fish like that are likely to become a meal. In fact, it's best not to keep your butterfly fish with any other fish that likes to swim near the surface of the aquarium, even if it's too large to be eaten, because some butterfly fish can be a bit territorial and will drive off any other species that enters its territory. Also keep in mind that fast fish that feed at the surface can outcompete your more timid butterfly fish at feeding time, so please remember to plan accordingly. Peaceful bottom-dwelling species such as coolie loaches and Corydoras catfish would be ideal tank mates. You'll also want to avoid any fish that has a reputation for fin nipping, because the long, thin ventral fins of the butterfly fish makes for a very tempting target. If you intend on breeding your butterfly fish, then setting up a single species tank is really the best way to go. These fish can be aggressive with each other every now and then, but it's mostly at feeding time, it's never very serious, and no one has been injured. So it's fine to keep a small group of butterfly fish together if you have a large enough tank that leaves some room at the top for everyone. I have three butterfly fish in a 40-gallon breeder, and they're the only fish in this tank. Putting two of them in their own 20-gallon long tank would also be appropriate. They grow to a length of around 4 or 5 inches, or 10 to 13 centimeters, and if properly cared for, you can expect them to live for around 4 to 5 years. And since these fish are relatively sedentary, they don't necessarily need a lot of room to swim around in. The vast majority of their time is spent at the top of the aquarium, so the depth of the tank is not as important as the length and the width because the more surface area that you can provide for each fish, the better. Whatever size tank you choose, be sure that it has a tight-fitting lid and that you keep the lid on when you're not servicing the tank, because these fish will not hesitate to jump out of the tank and onto the floor. For filtration, I'm using a single large sponge filter and I heat the tank to somewhere between 80 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 to 28 degrees Celsius. The filter and the heater are placed on the same side of the tank so that the current created by the filter helps distribute the heat from the heater. And since these fish come from bodies of water where there's very little water movement, I don't want to subject them to a strong current. So, I reduce the current created by the filter by surrounding it with a dense layer of live plants. 
These plants include a large clump of Suswasertang, a couple small Anubias, some Java moss and pearlweed, as well as my favorite floating plant, frogbit. I've also placed a large piece of floating driftwood down the length of the tank that acts as a baffle to reduce motion at the surface of the water. I'm using a black sand substrate that's about an inch and a half thick. The sand is topped with random pieces of driftwood as well as with dried leaves collected from a local forest. Floating driftwood is a nice addition to their setup, but under bright light, it can be a magnet for algae. However, the light on this tank isn't very powerful, which helps keep the algae in check. The driftwood adds tannins to the water and helps lower the pH, which the fish prefer. It also helps to define different territories for each fish in the tank, while also providing a dry resting place for water-weary crickets while they await their fate. These crickets won't drown if they're not eaten right away. In fact, they'll continue living on these little bits of dry land until they go to cricket heaven, which will most likely be in the mouth of a fish. Floating plants are highly recommended, and I've found that the easiest one to maintain is a plant called frogbit. In fact, I wouldn't keep butterfly fish in a tank that didn't contain floating plants. Nonetheless, I would avoid duckweed at all costs, but some water sprite floating at the surface would be nice. Plants that grow beneath the waterline are less important to these fish, but they're always a nice touch. And the plants feed off of the waste products produced by the fish, so they help keep the water clean. Any of the various Anubia species are a good choice, and they'll grow above the surface of the water as long as you have a tight-fitting lid so that the air above the water is kept humid. Butterfly fish scatter their floating eggs in vegetation at the top of the water, so this tank has lots of plants both above and below the surface. I don't fill the tank completely, and this tank has about 5 inches of space between the surface of the water and the lid. The African butterfly fish prefers water that is warm, soft, and slightly acidic, and this becomes even more important if you're attempting to breed them. These amazing fish are specially adapted for living in stagnant bodies of water where there are very low levels of dissolved oxygen. And in order to cope with these oxygen-poor environments, the African butterfly fish can pull in air from above the surface of the water and then force that air down into the swim bladder, where an extensive network of tiny blood vessels lining the swim bladder captures the oxygen in the water and then sends it into the bloodstream. In fact, the butterfly fish is an obligate air breather, which means that it must be able to get air from the surface of the water because the gills alone cannot supply the body with enough oxygen to keep it alive. And this is why every so often you'll see these fish release a small air bubble when they take a breath at the surface. Butterfly fish are ambush predators that use a feeding strategy where they sit motionless just under the surface of the water and wait for the telltale ripples that are created when something falls into the water and then begins to struggle on the surface. They're able to detect even the smallest ripples by using specialized organs located along the upper portion of the body. The information received from these organs allows the butterfly fish to pinpoint the exact location and the approximate size of whatever it is that's creating the ripples. 
So the fish can then decide if it's moving like something small and edible, or if it's moving like something to be avoided, like a wading bird. The eyes of the butterfly fish are also equipped with specialized structures that allows them to see both under the water and above the water at the same time. This ability enables the butterfly fish to scan the area above the water, looking for possible threats as well as potential prey items, while still keeping an eye out for danger beneath the waterline. Keep watching the eyes of this fish. Hmm, I wonder what that's all about. These fish have very large mouths that are designed for feeding on large prey items that are captured at the surface of the water. The upturned mouth also makes it easier for them to breathe at the surface, and it's very similar in shape to another fish known as the arowana, to which they are only distantly related. And now we'll take a closer look at the fins of the butterfly fish, beginning with the most obvious ones first. These are the pectoral fins, and these are the fins that earns this fish its name. Although several people have pointed out that the butterfly fish looks more like a moth than a butterfly. These enlarged pectoral fins are believed to help the butterfly fish stay hidden from predators by making it resemble a dead leaf rather than a tasty fish. The center portion of each pectoral fin is transparent so that this part of the fin takes on the color of whatever is in the background, which further adds to their ability to blend in with their surroundings. The butterfly fish can use their enlarged pectoral fins to jump out of the water and into the air as they attempt to grab prey items that are above the surface of the water. This jumping behavior is also said to be used as a way to avoid predators. However, from what I've seen, when they're frightened, their usual reaction is to dive down in the water rather than jump out. Avoiding predators by jumping out of the water might be used more often in very shallow water where there's no way to dive down in order to avoid danger. But then again, I guess it all depends on what's chasing you. Butterfly fish don't flap their pectoral fins like the wings of a bird when they jump. However, they can apparently use these enlarged fins to glide for short distances. The pectoral fins can also be pulled in against the body, but the only time I've ever seen them do it is when they yawn. And now, moving on to the dorsal fin, we can see that it's small and positioned near the tail, which enables the butterfly fish to float at the surface without having its dorsal fin sticking out of the water. The tail fin, also known as the caudal fin, is large and has a very unusual shape. This powerful fin enables the butterfly fish to move with sudden bursts of speed. And this fin right here is called the anal fin, and it's how we'll be able to tell the males from the females.
We'll get to that in a minute, but first I'd like to talk about these paired ventral fins that have been highly modified for a very specific function. But exactly what that function is seems to be open to some interpretation. It has been speculated that the long filaments of the ventral fins help the fish maintain its balance when it jumps. It has also been suggested that the elaborate ventral fins are used to help detect prey on the surface of the water. However, they're pointed in the wrong direction, and these fish already have special organs that are used for detecting their prey. I suspect that one of the functions of these modified ventral fins might be to give the fish a sense of touch, similar to the way a gourami uses its long, thin ventral fins to touch and taste objects in its environment. As I mentioned earlier, the anal fin of the butterfly fish is how we're able to tell male from female. The female has an anal fin with an outer edge that forms a nearly straight line from the top to the bottom, and her anal fin is fairly uniform in its shape. The anal fin of the male butterfly fish has an outer edge that does not form a straight line from the top to the bottom. His anal fin also has an elongated fin ray that extends well beyond the edge of the fin. The female fertilizes her eggs internally, and the male has a modified anal fin that is believed to help with the transfer of sperm to the female during spawning. Internal fertilization is the same method used by guppies when they mate. However, the anal fin of the male butterfly fish is very simplistic when compared to the modified anal fin of a male guppy. Here's the same fin on a male guppy. It's built so that when the fin is brought forward, it folds to form a tube that's then used to transfer sperm from the male to the female. It's a complicated piece of machinery. Now, look at the anal fin of the male butterfly fish. It's pretty simplistic by comparison, so I'm quite curious as to how this very ordinary looking fin is used to help transfer the male's sperm. Now, it's important to note that we're not really sure if these fish use internal fertilization because visual observations have not yet been made to confirm how the eggs are fertilized. However, there are several anatomical features on these fish that strongly suggest that they probably use internal fertilization, but the details of these reproductive structures are well beyond the scope of this video. This notch in the anal fin only occurs on the male, and here you can also see that his fin appears to have two different parts, an upper section and a lower section. This trait is unique to the male. I haven't been able to breed these fish, but I'm hoping that I'll succeed at some point because I'd really like to film them spawning, but I'm not holding my breath. Apparently, they have an elaborate spawning ritual where the male follows the female all around the tank in an attempt to mate with her. Courtship and spawning can go on for several days and can result in a couple hundred eggs or more. They don't attach their eggs to anything, preferring instead to scatter them in dense vegetation at the top of the water. After spawning, the eggs float at the surface for about 24 hours, then the eggs darken in color and sink to the bottom of the tank where they'll continue to develop until they hatch. The incubation period for the eggs is said to be somewhere around two to three days, but estimates vary and the exact timing of these events will be determined by the temperature of the water. Upon hatching, the fry remain on the substrate until the yolk sac is fully absorbed. Then, the free-swimming fry will begin to move to the surface where they'll hopefully start to eat. 
There's no parental care of the fry or the eggs, and the parents will eat them if given the chance, so it's best to remove the eggs and the fry just as soon as you see them. However, the real difficulty with breeding the African butterfly fish lies in feeding the fry, who don't actively move around looking for food, so their food needs to be placed right in front of them in order for them to eat. It's usually recommended that you lower the water level in the fry tank so that it's only a couple inches deep. This shallow water allows their food to be concentrated right near the surface where they'll find it. Infusoria, baby brine shrimp, and vinegar eels are all good first foods for the fry. The brine shrimp and the vinegar eels also tend to swim right at the surface where the baby butterfly fish will congregate. These strange fish are not for everyone. They don't have any vivid colors and they don't move around a lot, but they're still fascinating fish nonetheless. And as far as I can tell, no one's breeding these fish commercially, so all of the freshwater butterfly fish that you see in stores are taken directly from the wild. And in order to ensure that we can continue enjoying these fish for many years to come, it's important that we learn more about them, especially how to breed them in captivity. A captive breeding program would also mean less pressure on wild populations and native habitats. Hopefully, the information contained in this video will make it easier for other fish keepers to maintain and even breed these odd little fish. Well, if you've made it this far, then you've obviously found some real value in what I create. Thank you. And if you'd like to help support my effort to continue bringing you these high-quality documentaries, here are some of the many ways that you can help.